Well, I would like to turn you to Galatians chapter 2, and as yesterday to verse 20. All of the themes that we're looking at, they're all found in this section, and many of them in verse 20. And so it's a bit of a springboard uh, out into the rest of the book. So we'll come to chapter 3 uh, in due time, but it's verse 20 of chapter 2 that is our text. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It's that central statement that we're going to focus on. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. Now, the danger that the book of Galatians is addressing is the possibility that genuine Christians who are the children of God can nevertheless end up living as if they were still slaves. The gospel can just be a theoretical thing. Or even if it's genuinely believed, we can fail to work it out deep into our hearts and then into every relationship and into every circumstance. Now, what we're talking about there then is that the gospel is not just the message that we preach. The gospel is the very dynamic of our hearts. And so we're saying that what we need to be is gospel people, uh, not just gospel believers. Now, we've been uh, saying a number of things that define what a gospel person is, according to the book of Galatians. A gospel person is someone who lives accepted. And we thought about our justification by faith. Then yesterday, we saw how uh, a gospel person is someone who lives free, no longer living by the flesh, following the patterns of the sinful nature, but now indwelt by the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit, living free. Now today, uh, we come to the third thing, and uh, the big idea here is that a child of God is someone who lives believing, that lives by faith. Or to put it another way, we don't live by keeping laws. We live by believing promises. Two very different things. So that's, uh, that's where we're going, and that's the statement in the middle of verse 20. Paul says, the life I now live in the flesh, in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. Now, faith, we know, is the, the beginning of the Christian life. It's the ABC of the Christian life. And when we talk about faith, what we mean is believing in Jesus, uh, believing what the Bible says about him, that he came for me, that he lived for me and is my righteousness, that he died for me and is my atonement, that he rose for me the third day and is my life. And coming to faith in Christ is about transferring your trust from yourself or your own performance in whatever shape that may take, transferring it from yourself and transferring it to him. Without a plan B and without a safety net. So uh, chapter 2 verse 16 really captures that. Uh, we have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ. Now that's faith and we, we talk about that and we know that. My point today is that faith is not just how it all begins, but faith is also how it is to progress. Uh, that we have to keep on believing. And that really every day, as every day begins and as every day progresses, we have to believe again. 
We have to take our stand again on Christ as our righteousness, as our atonement, as our life. We have to take our stand again and say, I don't live by the flesh today. I live by the spirit today. And then we're going to keep in step with him. So really the burden of what I want to say today is, is that faith is actually not just the beginning. It's not just the ABC of our Christian lives. It is the A to Z. You never leave it behind. You never replace it with anything else. That not only are we saved by faith, but we live a life of faith. And uh, that's what Paul is emphasizing here throughout this letter. He's got people who knew that once, but who've begun to live by the law. And he's saying to them, that's a big mistake. You've got to change. You've got to think differently. You've got to get back to faith. You've got to live by the promise, not by the law. So that's where we're going to go, and that's what we're going to think about this morning. Now, first thing I want to point out and talk about is the danger. Again, we've got two points. The first thing, then, I want to talk about the danger. What's going on in Galatia? Uh, And the danger is that having begun with faith, we then try to progress by the law. Uh, try to progress by willpower. Try to progress by trying harder to live the sort of life that we see in the laws of God and in the, in the examples of lives uh, lived in the scriptures. The danger of the Galatians that having begun with faith, we try to progress by law. Now in Galatia, this has happened because false teachers have come in. Uh, Paul talks about them in verse 4 of chapter 2. Uh, more generally, you know, this was a, a phenomenon in the early church. This wasn't the only time this problem arose. <laughs> but these teachers had come into Galatia, and uh, they had a Jewish background, and they were saying, look, look at the law that we've got in the Old Testament. Yes, we've got to believe in Jesus. He's the Messiah. Yes, we have faith in Jesus. Yes, he died for us. Yes, he paid for our sins. Yes, we are Christians. We believe in him. But, but, but surely we're not going to forget the laws, are we? I mean, God gave us those two, didn't he? Surely we need to keep those. We can't just abandon circumcision. We can't just abandon all those food laws. We can't just abandon all those festivals and ceremonies. So surely... Now that we've believed in Christ, if you really want to progress, if you really want to move into the fullness of this, if you really want to be effective, then you've got to start taking seriously your responsibilities to fulfill these laws. You've got to try harder. You've got to do better. You've got to submit now to these institutions. And what they were saying then is, yes, you're saved by faith. But really to grow, you need the law. And as I've said, this is not the only time. It's clear from chapter 2, the early part of it, that this was a current that was running uh, through the early church in its earliest days. And in fact, in verse 12, uh, Paul talks about a circumcision party. You are a tribe, a group uh, within the early church that is arguing for this. Now, what we've got to see and understand is that when Paul realizes this is happening in Galatia, well, to say the least, he's a little unimpressed. Uh, To be more accurate, he hits the roof. Uh, He uses very strong language about this circumcision party uh, in verses 4 and 5. He calls them false brothers. And he says they have infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and their agenda is to make us slaves. And he says, when I've met this in the past, I tell you, we did not give in to them for a moment. Why? Verse 5, because the gospel was at stake. We didn't give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you in Galatia. Earlier on in chapter 1, he's described this teaching as a different gospel, another gospel which is really no gospel at all. 
And uh, we read the beginning of chapter 3 earlier on where Paul really uh, turns up the heat and he says to these Galatians, are you so foolish? Are you stupid? Don't you remember what happened having begun by the Spirit? Don't you remember what it was like when I first came? Don't you remember what it was like when you first believed? Don't you remember the joy? Don't you remember the power? Don't you remember how Jesus was clearly placarded before you as crucified? Don't you remember that that's what melted you? That's what broke you? That's what set you free? Don't you remember how he won your hearts? Don't you remember how you believed in him? Don't you remember how you were changed? You began with the spirit, he says. Do you really think now you're going to progress by keeping a few laws and rules? It's, it's, It's not comparable. It's something different, he's saying to them. So, Paul's point. He says, look, we all know the law cannot save us. But what Paul is saying in this letter is, not only can the law not save us, but once we are saved, the law cannot change us. And what he's saying to us is, be aware of this. And of course, what I'm trying to say is that this is still a live issue. Do you know, our our flesh... Our fallen humanity, we love laws. We love them. We are constantly inventing new ones. We're constantly coming up with standards uh, that we like to impose. Usually, they're laws for other people uh, to try and control them. Or sometimes to condemn them so that we feel a little bit better about ourselves but you know we also make rules for ourselves you know like the prodigal son there in the pigsty he comes to his senses doesn't he He realizes the mess he's made of his life he remembers the father's house he remembers that even the hired servants even the day laborers in his father's house have enough to eat and they are clothed and they are clean and he comes to his senses and he says I'm going home But you notice what he does next. It's a good thing to say, isn't it? I'm going home. Uh, Turn back to Jesus. I'm going home. That's a good thing to do. But you notice what arises next in his heart. I'm going home. I'm going to say to my father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Good. That's all good stuff. Confession, repentance, turning. But then he comes up with this. Make me like one of your hired servants. Give me a chance, Lord. Let me show you that I can be better. Let me earn my way back into the household. Let me demonstrate that I'm not what I used to be. Let me clean up my act a bit. And then, and then when I've shown you that I'm better than you think, then will you take me back? He's inventing some rules for himself. We all do that. Well, Galatians is here to nail this once and for all. Two things uh, in, from chapter 3, really. And uh, what Galatians gives us is, is some clear teaching about how to handle the law and what the law is all about and the place it's supposed to have in our Christian lives. Um, so I, I'll say two things about it. Uh, Number one, Paul is saying, Galatians is saying, you will never progress in the Christian life by trying to keep the law of God. You'll never do it. Now, there are, of course, lots of laws in the Bible, and it is absolutely true that they are all good. So please don't hear me say anything negative about the law of God. They are good. They are perfect. Paul is not saying they are not good. Paul is not saying they are not relevant. What Paul is saying is the law has a specific purpose. And and what he teaches us in in Galatians 3 is that that purpose is not justification. It's not do your bit and God will accept you and you will be justified by your works. We talked about that on Tuesday. Uh, The law can't justify you. That's not its purpose. But now Galatians is also teaching us that the purpose of the law is not sanctification either. 
You're not going to become holy by trying to keep the law. No, the purpose of the law, according to Galatians 3, is not justification, it's not sanctification, it is demolition. That's the purpose of the law. The law is given to destroy our greatest enemy. And our greatest enemy is our self-righteousness. We stick to it. We cling to it. We defend it. Because our life does depend on it. At least that's what we're convinced of. And so, Paul talks here about the law being come uh, into our lives to do a demolition job. He says it in verse 19, actually, of chapter 2. He says, through the law, I died to the law. It wasn't through the law I found life. No, through the law, I found death. See, a demolition job. The I, the flesh that is self-righteous, that thinks I can do this, that thinks I can cling to something and, and, and make myself acceptable through it and because of it, when I came and actually looked at the law, when the law began to come alive in my life, it slew me. I realized that I cannot keep it. Not only that, in chapter 3, he goes on to say that the purpose of the law, having demolished us, is to drive us to a savior. It's to bring us to a point where we realize we cannot do this on our own. And then to set us seeking for someone who can do it for us. So, chapter 3, verse 24, uh, the summary verse, if you like. The law was put in charge. Why? To lead us to Christ. Why? So that we might be justified by faith. So, the law is good. It is God's law. The law is a reflection of God's own being and character. So the law can show us what holiness looks like. It can be a guide to our feet and a light to our path. But though the law can show you what holiness looks like, it cannot make you holy. Not because there's something wrong with the law. Uh, Have I said this already? The law is holy and good. When Jesus came... He was born under the law. He saved us by fulfilling the law, by generating a righteousness that is available to us as a gift, and then by paying the penalty of the law on the cross. So Jesus doesn't dismiss the law. No, Jesus doesn't set aside the law. He fulfills the law. There's nothing wrong with the law. And, Paul even said in the reading, if we could obey the law... If it was possible, the law could give us life. But the problem is in us. You know, if if the law is a ladder that could lead us to heaven, we are dead and helpless at the bottom. We simply cannot climb it. If we could obey the law, okay, the law could give us life, but we can't obey it. And so in the other great book on this subject, the other great passages on this subject in Romans, in Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 3, Paul says, the law is powerless to save. Not because there's anything wrong with the law, but because it depends on the flesh. See, if you're going to say, okay, I know what I need to do now, I know how I need to live, so if I only lived like this, then I would be good enough, then I would be okay, The only power you've got to achieve that is is willpower. It's the, 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 the strength of your own self. And that's not enough. And if you attempt that, you're making a fundamental mistake. You are bringing a knife to a gunfight. And that never ends well. So that's the first thing. Galatians is here to tell us. But I, but I want to, to point out a second thing which is here, still talking about the warning, about living by the law, because there's a lot here about what happens if you try it. What happens if you try now to progress in the Christian life by keeping the law? What happens if you try and say, well, the law of God is what will make me holy, and so I'm really going to try and keep it? What happens? Well, 
There's quite a lot of Galatians illustrating what will happen. And it's not a pretty sight. And obviously it's not. If you, if you ask the law now and say, okay, I want the law to help me progress in my Christian life. What you're really doing, it's, it's like asking a demolition crew to build your house. And that has to end badly. And that's just not what they do, is it? They don't build, they break down. And they're going to make a mess. And so, again, in Romans uh, chapter 7, there's a whole chapter, really, where Paul is talking about the mess that the law made in his life. It was uh, there to demolish his self-righteousness. And so he talks, really, about how the law, though it's good and holy, if you try to actually obey it, it sort of stirs up your sin. It brings it to light. It brings it to life. And and he's really talking about the sort of perversity of our fallen humanity, of our flesh. You know, we're so perverse that even when something good is seen, it just aggravates us the other way. Uh, We have experience of this, I think. Every parent has experience of this. If you say to most children, okay, I'm leaving the room, don't touch that. What have you just guaranteed? (laughs) You just guaranteed that whatever that is, it is going to be touched. Now that's what Paul is saying. The law, it doesn't doesn't stop us, it stirs us. It doesn't uh, quell our sin, it stirs our sin. That's there in Romans 7. (laughs) Do you know, that's why legalistic people and legalistic churches are so difficult because they're trying to keep the law all they've got is willpower and instead of um, giving them progress it's stirring them up and actually I think it's probably worth just trying to spell out for a few minutes how that works so think about this imagine now you're trying it imagine now you're really trying to 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 keep the law and you think it's going to make you holy uh, by trying hard to keep the law so you've got willpower you've got these rules and you're trying to keep them well we've already said from Romans 7 the law will stir up your sin but it's going to do something else if if your sin starts getting stirred up that's going to stir up a lot of guilt in your life and a lot of shame in your life and that will often manifest itself as a sort of low-level, free-floating anxiety that's just there in the background. Now, it's not the only reason you might have some free-floating anxiety, so please don't hear me say that either. But it is a reason. That, in turn, is going to generate some insecurity. You know, someone who's trying to keep the rules is always an insecure person. They're always thinking, have I done enough? Always. It's, it's there in the background. So, um, well, I came to Abba. That's got to be worth a bit. Maybe I can relax for a few weeks. I miss church on Sunday. That's a step back. You know, we can be insecure all the time. You have a, and, and, and that insecurity then creates instability. So you have a good week, and uh, you're strong and robust, full of faith. Uh, you have a bad week, and you slink into the back of church, and you daren't even take communion. What also happens is that the external things become more and more important. See, you're not really coping internally. You're not coping with your heart and that you're anxious about what's going on inside. The flesh is having a field day. So you have to go back to those old righteousnesses that you used to have. You have to focus on the externals. So like it says in chapter 3, verse 28, you you pick up that list, list again. The Jew and the Greek and the slave and the free and the male and the female. And you fix on one of those things and you, you elevate that and you say, well, that'll make me feel better. You know, I'm, I'm maybe not much of a... Uh, dealing with my sin very well but but I am a Jew or I am not a Jew or I am uh, a free person or I am a good person or I am a rich person or I am a respected person or I am doing my best or these people like me you know you go back to that old self-righteous dynamic of trying to fix on some external and and making it your righteousness the other thing that happens is that you become a very critical person 
Because you need to cover up, don't you? And one of the best ways of covering up your own failures is to point out other people's. So you smoke screen. And so you're the person that's always got that opinion, always got something to say about what's wrong with somebody else. The other thing that happens is you start to feel a fraud because you're pretending all the time. And you go to church and you need to look like you're doing a good job and you need to look like you're the right sort of person. And so you, you present a front. And, uh, but you know that what people think of you is not what you really are. And what goes along with that is exhaustion. Because maintaining an image is exhausting. And all the while, you are powerless against sin. And all the while, the besetting sins of your life are strengthening their grip. Because the only power you have to fight them is willpower. And so you end up being a bit escapist. Uh, sometimes it's all too much, so you, you look for ways to forget it all for a while. And you know, as an escapist person is an accident waiting to happen. Because you can easily be drawn into something life-destroying. And if you keep on like this, do you know what will happen in the end? You'll dust off your hands and you'll walk away from Jesus. And you'll say to people, I tried it and it didn't work. Well, now you're depressed. So let's hasten to the second point because none of that is what's supposed to be going on. None of that is what we're supposed to be doing. None of that is supposed to be the way it works. There is another way. So here's the second point. And here we're coming to that statement in the middle of verse 20. Where he says, the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. You see, it's not just the ABC and then you get on with the rules. No, it's not just the ABC. It's the A to Z. You never leave the promise behind Day by day, you're believing the promise. That's how you progress. And, and what this verse does, why it's so powerful, is it takes us to the very heart of what we're really trying to talk about. It's what has been called our union with Christ. Now, let's think about this. Let me read the rest of 2.20. Oh, sorry, go back a bit to the beginning of verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And the phrase in the middle, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Right, union with Christ. What's going on here? Well, you notice it. He's using the language of Easter. The crucifixion, the empty tomb, the resurrection, life. So it's the language of Easter. But he's not using it in the usual way. He's not using it in the way that the Gospels use the language when they tell the story of Easter. He's doing something unusual here. He's using the language of Easter, crucifixion and resurrection, but he's using it about his own experience. Now, what we need to get here is that when you believed in Christ, something happened in heaven. You were justified. We're going to see tomorrow that you were adopted. So something happened in heaven. God did something in heaven. A decree was given. But, and this is the point for today, something also happened in you. Now, if we were in the book of John or in Titus, we'd be talking about being born again. But here, Paul is putting it differently. So let's think about what he says. What he says is this. When you believed in Jesus, when I believed in Jesus, yes, I was justified. Yes, I was adopted. But something happened in me. He said, this is it. I had my own personal Good Friday. I have been crucified with Christ, he says. And I no longer live. He's talking about the old Paul, the persecutor of chapter 1, uh, the self-obsessed person, the one who's just empowering his inner desires and making a horrendous mess of his life and other people's lives. He's saying the flesh, the old Paul that loves making rules, that lives by works, that holds you captive, that is destroying you. He says, when I believed in Jesus, that old me was defeated. He says, stronger than that, he says that old me was crucified. 
Now, that's a gruesome image. Don't sanitize it. That's a gruesome image. The old you is a rebel, and it needs to be executed like a rebel. Crucifixion. And Paul says, that's what happened to me. It's a gruesome image, but look at him talking. It's also a wonderful reality. Now, the idea is, what he's saying is, when you believed in Jesus, something happened outside of you in heaven, but there's something happened inside of you. And what happened is that the self lost its power over you. It lost its right to control you. It lost its uh, legal power over your life. You are now dead to the old you. And you're dead to that old world that the old you was part of. And that old world of sin, of self, of the flesh, it now has no claim. It now has no hold. One of the clearest and most penetrating writers about Galatians was Martin Luther. And uh, he said about this reality, he says, whenever sin and death make you nervous, that happens. Whenever sin and death make you nervous, write it down, he says, as an illusion of the devil. Then he said this, talking about your status in Christ, he says, there is no sin now. There is no curse now. There is no death now. There is no devil now. Now, he doesn't mean objectively those things have gone, not yet. But he means internally, as far as what can influence and control you, they have no power. You are dead to them. That's what he's saying. And, and we, must, we must get this. This is sort of metaphorical language. It's sort of picture language. But actually, it's not a metaphor. It's not picture language. Uh, what Paul wants us to see is this is spiritual reality right now. If you have faith in Jesus, this is, this is spiritual reality within your being. You're no longer the person that you were. You're no longer the, controlled by the things that used to control you. You are dead to all of that. It has no legal rights over you. It cannot force you to do anything. It's spiritual reality now. And of course, one day, it will be physical reality but the point I'm trying to make is that this is how we defeat our sin and temptation. This is how we take on our, uh, our need to progress. We exercise faith in these promises that we have been crucified with Christ. We don't rely on our willpower. We, we recognize that this spiritual reality is true, that we're no longer controlled by the sinful nature. Again, back in Romans, Paul puts it this way. Chapter 6, verse 11. He says to the believers there, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. He, he, really, he's saying to us today, so maybe today, here you are, you're struggling with something, something that is part of the old you and it still hangs on. Maybe it's that pharisaical spirit. Maybe it's some pattern of behavior. Maybe it's some attitude or value. You know, it could be anything, couldn't it? You've got that. Well, what Paul is saying to us is this. That is defeated. It is defeated. So stop it. Do not submit to it. Reckon yourself dead to sin. Now, he's not here appealing to, to, to us to do a bit of positive thinking. You know, so don't hear that. This is not psychobabble. Uh, this is, th that word count is a literal word. It's an accounting term. What he's saying to us really is, do the maths. What's real? You know, when you count up your bank balance, you're not counting it up to, in order to persuade yourself that that's what's in there, even when it's not. You're there to find out what's really in there, whether that's good news or no. Well, that's the way he's talking. He's saying, you reckon yourselves, understand, count yourselves, realize, do the maths. This is not who you are. Now, that's how you grow as a Christian. That's how you fight guilt. That's how you fight the ongoing fear. That's how you deal with your pride. You do the maths. You feel the temptation. You say, that's not who I am anymore. 
I am one with Jesus and he has been crucified to this world. It cannot touch him anymore. And I have been crucified with him. It cannot touch me either. See our union with Christ. You've had your own personal Good Friday. And then he goes on. Not only does he say we've had our own personal Good Friday, he also says you've had your own personal Easter Sunday. See, Jesus was crucified, and then the third day he was raised. And Paul is using the language of resurrection. He's using the language of life. He says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's what he's saying. He says, just as you were crucified with him, so the moment you believed, you were raised with him spiritually, internally, a new life began. And he's got a very powerful way to say it in verse 20. He says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Now, forget the sermon for a minute. We need this. We need it clear in our minds and we need it real in our hearts. It is not enough to know that Christ is for us. That is foundational. That is the gospel. That is wonderful. But it is only half the story. It is not enough that Christ is for us. We also need Christ in us. So that as I am in him... So he is Christ for me, my righteousness, my atonement, my resurrection. So Christ is in me. So that I'm experiencing his crucifixion with regard to my old self. I'm experiencing his life and resurrection with regard to the new me. I'm being born again. I am a new creation. This is the other way it's put in other passages. I suppose my question at this point is just this. Is that what you've got? Have you just got a few rules? Can you see how different it is? It's not about keeping the law, it's about believing the promise. It's vast and it's possible to miss it. One of my heroes is George Whitfield, uh, lived in the 18th century, household name in the 18th century across the whole world, English speaking world. Astonishing. No internet, no aeroplanes, they knew him everywhere. He was a preacher. Uh, and he tells his conversion story at one stage. He was a young student. He was deeply religious. And he was utterly miserable. As religious people usually are. And he tells this story. My old friend, Mr. Charles Wesley, put a book into my hands. And the title of this book was, The Life of God in the Soul of Man. That's what Paul's talking about. The life of God in the soul of man. And this book said, George Whitfield goes on, a man may go to church, say his prayers, receive the sacraments, and yet not be a Christian. And Whitfield goes on, I trembled, he says, I trembled like a poor man that is afraid to look into his account book in case he finds that he's bankrupt. And yet, he says, what am I going to do? Shall I burn the book? Shall I throw it down? Shall I put it by? Or shall I read it? Shall I search into it? That's a dilemma, isn't it? And I don't know, maybe that's a dilemma that you are in. You're hearing these things. Time and time again this week, and you're thinking... I, I, shall I look into this or shall I burn it? It's only a couple of days. I can go home. I can forget it all. I go back to normal. Well, that's where Whitfield was. Shall I burn the book or shall I read the book? Well, he says this, holding the book in my hand, I pray to the God of heaven and earth. That's a good thing to do. He prayed this, Lord, if I am not a Christian, if I am not a real one, for Jesus Christ's sake, show me what Christianity is that I may not be damned at last. 
You see, that's the issue. It's not, can I have a reasonably nice life? It's damned at last. And then he finishes. They that know anything of religion show that it is a vital union with the Son of God. Christ formed in the heart. Right, we're nearly finished. I'm going to finish with this. Can you feel, this is where I'd like to go, this is what I've been praying for, can we feel the immensity of that? Christ in me. I mean, think who he is. He is the Lord of glory. Uh, Think of Isaiah 6, that vision of the Lord high and lifted up, and seraphim hiding their faces, crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Think of that vision. Tremble a little. Feel the earthquake. And then realize that in John 12, John says that what Isaiah was seeing was the glory of Jesus. He is the Messiah. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. Astonishing. Paul says it in verse 20, it was the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Not just a great man, the Son of God. Now, maybe, maybe, maybe this is the sticking point. Because this Jesus is not going to come into your life to be your assistant. When the Lord of glory comes to this, into somebody's life, they hand it over. There is unconditional surrender. And what I want you to see is that is what changes things. If you're going to make Jesus your example, if you're going to make Jesus your assistant, you will benefit nothing at all from his salvation. It's when he is Lord, when he has the car keys, when he has access to every room, every relationship, every moment, every sphere, every context of your life. That is when he comes in. And that is when things begin to change. That's when there is resurrection. That's when there's been that crucifixion. When Jesus Christ is Lord. Maybe that's the issue that you're stuck on. But until that moment, you are still Lord. And he's no help to you at all. No help. Well, what about it? Consider this. You read the Gospels. What happens when Jesus Christ comes to town? You know, we're talking about Jesus Christ as Lord coming into your life. Well, what happened in the Gospels when Jesus Christ came to town? I tell you what happened. Wonderful things happened. When Jesus Christ came to town, the people flocked. The blind were given their sight, the deaf were given their hearing, the dumb spoke his praise, the lame leapt for joy, the demons were driven out, sins were forgiven, even the dead were raised. You see, when Jesus comes somewhere, there's life. When Jesus comes, the kingdom comes. Can you see it? Maybe you can't see it. Well, maybe then, like blind Bartimaeus, you need to start saying, Lord, son of Davis, uh, David, have mercy on me. Maybe that needs to be your cry. Or maybe you cannot hear, and Jesus is calling your name, and you have not heard it. Well, maybe you need ears to hear, and you need to be praying to him, saying, Lord, give me ears to hear. Come on in. Help me hear it. Oh, we could go on. Maybe you're paralyzed in your life by fear. Well, you need just a word from him. You'll be walking and leaping and praising God. Maybe you feel you're untouchable. You've got a history. You've got a record. You need to hear Jesus say to you, I am willing, be clean. Maybe you're captive. Well, when Jesus comes, he can drive the demons out. Maybe you feel you're beyond help. Well, he could even call you from your grave. And he won't exploit you. And you know he won't exploit you. Why? Because he loved me. And he gave himself for me. 
Well, could this be then why you're here today? When he is Lord, that's when we find the power to rise up, to, to begin to strip off the grave clothes and to get out of the cemetery and to move out into the lives of others in love and witness. That's when you begin to realize you are not a slave, you are a child. And if you're a child, then you're an heir. And if you're an heir of God, you're a joint heir with Jesus. And maybe you've come to this conference with a powerful sense of fear or something that hangs upon you, a sense of guilt. Maybe you feel you are a failure. Maybe there is a lust which controls your life. Maybe you are terrified by the critics that are tearing you apart. Maybe you have a huge sense of entitlement. And you can't understand why life is so difficult. Maybe you've had some horrendous experience and you are in the grip of bitterness. Maybe you are utterly addicted to something and it holds you and controls you and maybe nobody knows. Well, what Paul is saying to you today, what Jesus is saying to you today is that it's time to rise up. That is not who you are. You are accepted in Christ. And whoever else does not accept you, the highest opinion in the cosmos has accepted you. And you are no longer controlled by the flesh. You now are dwelt, indwelt by the Spirit. And now we see that you are no longer controlled, no longer living the life you used to live. You've been united to Christ in his death and his resurrection. And that fear is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. And that failure is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. And that guilt is no longer Lord. Jesus is Lord. And that lust is no longer Lord because Jesus is Lord. And that bitterness is no longer Lord because Jesus is Lord. And that alcohol is no longer Lord because Jesus is Lord. And that self is no longer Lord because Jesus is Lord. It's time to exercise a little faith. And maybe the prayer that we need at the end of our session now is, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Let's pray. Lord, give us eyes to see what maybe we've never seen before. And we pray that the one Lord who is worthy would displace all competitors in our lives. And we pray that he would set us free. For Jesus' sake we ask. Amen.